he's going to call them to the next strip that we're going to strip graze. Which out of this 20 acres that gives the cattle about five acres a day is what we're grazing here. This main paddock, the whole rectangular paddock is about, um, about 20 acres is what it is. And it's of course fenced with high tensile. We start in the center. We've grazed all the way to the left side of this paddock. And now we're grazing to the right side where Cody is taking the cow this morning. He just took off the um, alligator clips right there in the corner so that the paddock is no, it's no longer hot. This was this fence that he's Take, that he has taken the alligator clips off, of course, was keeping them from going any further in this paddock. So that poly wire is no longer hot. <clears throat> and he's going to open that up, and the cattle are going to follow him into the next little about five acres. Since our water source is in the middle of the field, we're not using a back fence. So the cattle are able to run on yesterday's grass until we get completely done with this particular paddock. But this is necessary, like I said, because of our water source. But the cattle will spend most of their time in the newest strip where they've got the freshest grass, and they'll spend very little time going back onto yesterday's trample forage. we just moved them out of that little five acre patch 
he would have set up the, their fence to keep them from going any further, or you can see they've just about gone to it now. I always want to do this the day before, because the cow can get too excited, and if it's not set up and ready, they'll just push on through it and, uh, and keep going further than you really want them to go. See the cow are very content. Heads are all down. What he's doing now is going to take the poly wire he just rolled up. so much forage in there they're not concerned at all with trying to push through the poly wire that's stopping them and, and even though the sound of the ATV is like a dinner bell to them you know they've, they've got their lunch now they're all happy and content and they're not concerned at all about pushing through and getting to more fresh pasture they know that tomorrow they'll get the next patch Yet you saw Cody just come through, and it won't be hot till tomorrow when he takes the alligator clips off of the one that's keep holding him right now. And then he'll put the alligator clips on that one and make it hot to keep them there. And that's actually what he's doing in this instance, too. He's coming through the fence first. He hooks them on his overalls there. There's one side and the other. And that fence is hot. Job done. By the time on my video camera here, that took about 17 and a half minutes to complete. Not a lot of time spent in getting the job of moving cattle done. Thanks for putting. Thanks for putting up with me. Thanks for putting up with me for that. That's what we do on our ranch daily. My name is Cody Holmes. And the reason I wanted to show you that video. In the very beginning, before I had anything to say, I wanted for you to kind of set the stage for some of the things that we're talking about today. Um, we do that 12 months out of the year. It's not green like that 12 months out of the year. But we're moving cattle every day, sometimes twice a day, in that almost the same manner that I just that I just did. I'm going to try to do something here that I'm probably not capable of doing, and that's talking and holding this microphone at the same time. This is uh, uh, the January issue. Uh, the January issue of Beef Magazine. I'm not going. I'm not. I'm going to not going to disparage or promote this magazine. It's just I'm going to use it as an example. This come in, This came in. It comes in my mail every month, among many others. But and it, a lot of you guys probably get it too. But I'm going to use it as an example. I I would have put this in my overhead, but I didn't get it till after I already had my overhead for this presentation prepared. 
I'm going to be real brief with this, but I guess I think some pretty important things to say. I did in this magazine, she, this writer says, it's been a year full of feedlot financial problems, even though feedlot performance was excellent. So that means they're doing everything they think they can do. Thanks, that's thanks, that's thanks to good feeding weather, good cattle, good management, and good nutrition. If we, if we say we're doing, we've got good weather, we've got good cattle, we've got good management and good, good nutrition, why are they reporting horrible, a horrible situation? Maybe what we've always done in the past is not going to work for what we need to do in the future. Is that a possibility? I'm gonna read something else in the same magazine. A lot of you guys may have already read this. This is something that went back to KSU. Uh, what this was, well, it was reporting very profitable, so-called profitable operators of beef, beef cattle people to the low end or the unprofitable cattle people. If you were a very unprofitable or on the low end uh, of this report, which was dated uh, 2006 to 2010, it said what you had to look forward to on a net return to management on a per head basis on your cow operation, a grazing operation, you only lost four hundred. You only lost four hundred nineteen dollars per cow. That's on the low end. If you were successful, meaning it according to this report from KSU, if you were a a good manager of grazing livestock um, from 2000 to 2006 to 2010, according to Beef. You only lost seventy-five dollars per cow. I don't know about you guys, but that's not good enough for me. Um, Josh, where's the clicker? Okay, thanks. When you get old, you forget what they told you. Okay. I've been ranching for thirty-eight years on my own, not necessarily successfully. Before that, I, I was a kid on my parents' farm which was definitely not successful. And prior to that, my father was on his father's farm, which was not profitable either. About the year 1992, I had accumulated a number of cows because I grew up watching John Wayne movies and Ben Cartwright, and I knew that I wanted to be a, a cattle rancher. That's all I ever wanted to do. So like a lot of guys, I put all of my efforts in this thing. Okay. For over 25 years, we had grown up to about 1,200 cows, mom and cows. All we had was cow calf, didn't have any stockers. And we had accumulated some land, but we were renting an awful lot of land. I had worked a full-time job in the accounting field, a big part of my life, to accumulate some of this. And when I really started analyzing my return on investment, not even mention my time, what I was looking at is the kind of numbers that this beef magazine reported. At about that time, we're talking the early 90s, we started playing with a little bit of grazing. There wasn't really not much talk about rotational grazing, it was just grazing. Um, we had to make a, 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 a big decision. We had to make a decision where we were we going to exit this industry, take what equity we had built over 25 years, and say goodbye to agriculture. For a guy like me, an old war out cowboy, that was really, really not what I wanted to do. So we started looking at alternatives. Today, I am really glad we made some of those choices that we made. We sold every farm we had, sold back down to about 300 cows, and started making some big changes, which meant no machinery. And we started reading and learning and researching and talking to guys like Alan Savory and a whole bunch of others out there. Remember, this is back in the early 90s when it really wasn't as common. common. And certainly, I, that kind of language, and including myself, was about as far away from soil and water as everybody wanted to be. Let's fast forward now, about 15 or so years. We talked a little bit about holistic management. I'm not going to really, even though we're talking, I'm going to mention a few words. We've got very limited time. I believe that this, that the, that the, in, the, the, the entire meaning of holistic management is so big, we need many, many days to discuss it. But I, I'm going to hit one point right here. 
is that holism, holism or holistically managed land, families, businesses, it means in a, in a very short paragraph that the sum of the parts is greater than the independence that the individual parts represent. The holistic system helps to organize these parts and leads to sound dis decision making and holism is a requirement for sustainability. When I was building that herd up, I was doing everything that I was taught in school and all, all the other advice that I was getting. And yes, I was building up a cow herd. I was gaining some equity in real estate. Real estate, okay, not farm or ranch, it was real estate. But I hadn't really made any money in the cattle business. And that shows it in that beef magazine, okay? We had to make some changes. Today, the Rocket H Ranch, which is my ranch, we bought back 1,000 acres. And we were going to make a, a, a complete change. And today, this is where we're at with these numbers with our animals. We are multi-species grazing, both in plant and animal. And I'm all, I'm, I'm going to believe now, after doing everything the wrong way three or four times, that running only cattle on your operation would be like entering a boxing ring with one arm tied behind your back. Very, very difficult. We are a multi-species grazing operation. If you would have come up to me 10 years ago and said, Cody, I think that you should run sheep, I would have laughed you, laughed at you and walked away and wouldn't want to have had a conversation with you. Remember, you're an old cow, I'm an old cow man here. All I wanted to do was be Ben Cartwright on the Ponderosa. I wanted a big ranch and only cowboy, cowboys only had cattle. Well, let me tell you something, guys. One, if you go home with only one thing today that that's, I think has value concerning livestock species, okay? And I do not, I do not dislike cows. I really, really like cows. But show me a cow that can average two and a half babies a year. Show me a cow that can birth a calf, just one and raise that calf to fattening stage in the same year it's born, and do it two and a half times. Then I will have more interest in cows. Now, I, you saw I still have about 300 cow-calf pairs on my farm, so I have some interest in cows. They have a specific job to do in my holistic managed farm, or ranch, or operation. They are extremely important, okay? We now have more sheep than we do have cows. On this 1,000 acres that we bought back in just at the turn of the year 2000, the guy that was operating that ranch before I bought it run about 125 cows. And you know, I, I, one, of the, one of the slides that I saw on, the, on the, the young couple that was up here about feeding hay from the worst case scenario was from November 15th to April 15th. I've traveled all over this country from giving presentations like this down in Mexico all the way up in Ontario. And guess what I found out? I found out that the guys in, November, in, in, in Mississippi are the same as the guys in Ontario about feeding hay. They all start feeding hay on November 15th and stop feeding hay April 15th. So I really don't listen to people seriously when they say, yeah, you can do that in southern Missouri, but you can't do it in Montana. Or you can't do it in North Dakota, because you can, okay? Now, we're not going to talk only about not feeding hay. We're not going to talk only about what that what that uh, video showed about moving livestock from a new pasture to, a, to another pasture every day, because this holistic system that we're talking about isn't just about partitioning off feed for cows and only, let, and only giving them a, se a segment of it at a certain amount of time to conserve feed. That's what it appears like at first at, at first sight, that's what we're doing. But that video, at, at first sight, it, it just looks like all we're doing is saving a little feed, okay? It is much, 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 much more involved than just partitioning out a certain amount of feed to your livestock on a daily basis. And I hopefully, when you leave here, you'll leave with enough information to see that what we're, what this, Mig management, or this grazing management, or this rotational management, it's not about partitioning out feed at all. We do have more sheep. 
I really like my sheep primarily because of the profitability of the sheep. We also have a bunch of hogs. And they're on pasture. We get about 12 to 14 inches of snow a year in the wintertime. Our low temperatures are down close to zero in January at night. The highs are 35, 40 in that range. So we do have cold weather. We do have ice. We pig outside. Our good sows will pig outside on grass up to three times a year. On the right hand side is a picture of my wife. She was the one that was narrating that video. Um, we do have a, a many different species of enterprises on our farm. One of the enterprises that my wife is 100% in charge of is our Jersey cowherd. It is also one of the most profitable enterprises on our farm. We started that by accident. We have always had a family milk cow and my wife has always managed that milk cow and, and for many, many, many years she simply milked the family cow or two that we kept for ourselves out in the pasture. When she finally got to about 20 head, she finally gave up like a civilized woman should and she went and started using the milk barn and used what they call an automatic milk it's electric. She, did, she didn't know what they were but she refused to do it. Um, the, Jersey, the Jersey milk that we sell, we sell raw and we earn approximately, I'm not gonna get into a lot of financial details as far as enterprises go, but I'm gonna give a very little bit. We earn approximately $4,000 of gross sales per Jersey cow, plus the sale of the calf that we have. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Remember the very best scenario that the KSU report said? You're only gonna lose $75 a year on your beef cow. I'm telling you that, that little yellow cow on the right hand side that you're looking at, we can gross about $4,000 a year without even taking into consideration the selling of calves. Let's go a little bit further. We, you saw on that earlier slide that we have also lane hens. On the left hand side is one of our portable um, lane hen uh, trailers that we pull around. I don't want to say we necessarily follow the cow herd, it gets a little bit more, not diff, not necessarily complex, but more involved than that. Um, we probably normally have only three to 500 lane hens. That's generally because we need more help on the ranch, which I'll go into a little bit how we've been solving some of that labor issue. You can imagine with adding these more species to your farm or ranch, it isn't just moving cattle once a day. There's a whole lot more involved. And remember on that video, my, one of the last words that my wife said, that that moving of those cattle took 17 minutes. So the moving of the cattle is really a very small part of what I'm going to talk about today. However, it's extremely important. On the right hand side is a, a close up shot of some of the prettiest birds on the world in the world. Those are just regular turkeys. We fatten out turkeys for Thanksgiving. Um, several hundred. When we get done with uh, selling turkeys, we usually have quite a few left over because we never know. You get to start growing a turkey on grass around the end of May and, and we butcher them close to Thanksgiving. So it's just an estimate back in the spring how many we need to sell. We take the leftover birds and we take them back to our processor, have them ground up into ground turkey and sell it for $11 a pound and it flies out of the freezer. Unbelievable. Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss other people. I can guarantee you, in my neighborhood, I'm a laughing stock because I'm the funny farmer because we do all these other things across the farm. One of the things that we have now that we've had for probably about three years that I'm extremely excited about, again, if you would have told me 10 years ago I would be going this direction, I would, I would really not want to talk about it. We have about 200 goats. I said goats, yeah. And we're not using them to practice roping with. We're their goats. They convert some of the roughest forage on the farm to a very valuable product at the end. Um, in Missouri, there's a fellow by the name of Mark Kennedy, which is pretty much the goat expert in our area. He is. Uh, he works for Soul and Water. Some of these guys might have run across him. Um, when I first started getting inter interested in, these, in this goat situation, and remember the reason that I'm considering is this, in the first place, I got all this brush growing up, okay? Um, what I consider unutilized. 
And I knew it probably had some value. We used no sprays, no pesticides, and we did not own a brush hog. And in Southern Missouri, that's a very strange, strange way to operate. What I mean is, in a brush country and you use no herbicides to get rid of brush and you use no brush hog, you would be a real oddball. That's why my, one of the reasons my neighbors discuss me like small minds discuss other people. So I thought, well, some of the guys like, like, uh, um, like Enos are talking from South Africa are talking about using some of these other species. A good friend of mine, Greg Judy, has talked about it for years. So about three years ago, we started buying a few goats and putting them out there. And I didn't know how many we needed. So I had Mark Kennedy from Solar Water come out. Remember, the expert on goats. Because I certainly am not an expert on goats. So I said, Mark, I need you to spend part of the day with me. Let's ride around on the four-wheeler, take a look at what I've got. Tell me how many goats can I run on this thousand acres without reducing the other animals. Remember, I still kind of like my cows a little bit. Didn't want to reduce my cow numbers. Remember, this is a ranch that was running 125 cows on my body and feeding hay from November till April. We now run 300 cows. And this other stuff that I'm getting ready to tell you about. I didn't want to reduce my cow numbers, but I wanted to, I wanted to make the ranch more efficient. Mark, how many cow, how many goats can I run? Make a long story short, Mark says you can run about a thousand goats on your property and never get rid of your good, never get rid of your brush. And something else I want to tell you, Cody, I just finished a research, research paper on the value of running goats on a farm or a ranch. And here's my here's my end results in a nutshell. This is what Mark told me. If you run a goat per acre, if you can run a goat per acre or whatever you're running, the stocking rate varies. But the value of that goat, comparable to alfalfa, which is in the neighborhood of two to hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars a ton, your brush run through a goat is valued at a little over six hundred dollars a ton. Well, we did a little bit of mathematics. I'm not very good at math, but with a thousand goats, what I found out with when I come back around is those thousand goats that are doing nothing but cleaning up my brush produce more income than my entire counter. So when I say, guys, running your farms and ranch with only beef cows is like stepping into a boxing ring with one hand tied behind your back. That is what I'm talking about. We are moving in a position where one enterprise alone on our, on our ranch, meaning the goat enterprise, is on its way to producing more income than, my, than what was my primary enterprise in the beginning, being the cow herd. Okay? That sounds like it's saying a lot, Remember, I just gave you a report that said the best you can do is lose $7,500 a year per cow, so maybe that's not saying a whole lot. I don't necessarily agree 100% with that scenario in the, in the beef magazine. I think our cows can make a profit, okay? They will never, ever make as much money as that sheep or that goat, ever. Here's, here's kind of a summary of what we're looking at, why, why I was getting ready to exit agriculture quite a few years ago and give up. Farm income increased from 1949 to 1990. Farm income increased 407%. And that sounds like a wonderful thing until you look at expenses, which increased almost 1900%. So the result was for every $1 increase in income, doing things the way we were taught to do them, increased expenses $4. I, I would venture to estimate that the best producer 60 years ago, in, if we were to index it in current day dollars, was making more than losing $75 a cow. I think we've gone backwards, terribly bad. I think we've gone backwards not only in cow production. Remember, the, the first article I read said at the feed yards, we've got excellent animals, excellent management, excellent feed, and they're losing money hand over fist. We've gone backwards. We're not, folks, we're, we're not doing what we should be doing. One of the reasons we, took, we bought off on this thing that bigger cows and bigger farms, everything in high production, more bushels per acre, more pounds weight per cow is something that we should strive for. High EPDs. Don't get me started on the high EPDs. I'll never be able to finish this program. I am so sick of seed stock producers cramming down, especially young guys, this EPD story about how I'm going to make your cow herd profitable. I'm selling you a bull that's been eating 20 pounds of grain today. You kick him out on your ranch when you eat there. It's no grain. 
And he's lucky if he breeds 10 to 15 cows a year before his feet goes bad or before you have to kill him. That's what we're talking about here. Very bad management advice from that goes way, way back. That's been perpetuated by a lot of folks, some well-meaning, some not so well-meaning. We've got to get off of that train ride or leave agriculture like I almost did. Albert Einstein said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. I'm not a guy with a lot, a lot of courage. If somebody was to drop a, a dish behind me and break it, I would probably scream like a little girl. I just know that what I've been doing in the past, what my dad, what my grandpa on both sides did, was not good. It did not work. It hasn't worked for over 75 years. If you question that, ask yourself how many full-time cowmen do you know who make their entire living off their cows? That means they do not work in town, their wives do not work in town, and hopefully they didn't inherit some big chunk of money. There are not very many. Not very many at all. In the June issue of Beef Our Industry, this was by Wes Ishmael, our industry and university systems have focused on single trait measurements. Remember EPDs? For more than 50 years, we haven't focused on or measured profitability. It's got to be profitable because the fun wears out pretty quick. I'll tell you, after about 25 years of unprofitability, it, it was getting real thin around my property. Real thin. The fun was wearing out. We forgot about animal husbandry. We can learn about rotational grazing. We can learn about multi-species plants. We also have to learn a little bit about the animal himself. And there are other animals besides cows. I like cows. I still own cows. But there is a whole world out there that we have, me personally, I have missed. I have missed it completely. That part of learning this entire holistic system means we have to develop an understanding and a, a more in-depth knowledge, we have to gain more in-depth knowledge on animal husbandry, okay? When I speak of animal husbandry, I don't, I'm not talking about learning about vaccination programs. I'm not learning about what antibiotic to use. In, in my type of operation and many other guys that I've spoke to that I know of, some I know well, can vouch for this, what I'm going to tell you now. When you change your system into this, and we can call it a holistic system if you want to, because it is holistic, but it's, it's a lot more than just holistic management, okay? It's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it extends in all, it's got a lot of fingers that's extended in a lot of areas. We, we have to learn more than, than just very, very simple, elementary, under, have an understanding more greater than just how many nutrients it takes to put a pound of meat on, a, on an animal. There's so much more out there. And this other side of this thing is really very simple. It's not near as complex. And these, what I was getting ready to tell you about these other guys that can vouch for it, under this type of management, this type of operating your farm and ranch, the need to have a deep understanding of such things as fertility requirements in the EPD line, vaccinations, immunizations, antibiotics. We don't use those things anymore. We don't use any of those things anymore, ever. We don't wean our calves. And yes, you guys are getting ready to experience. You can leave your calves on your cows year round. Not year round because they will wean them off about a month before they have a new baby. If they don't have a new baby, they may not ever wean them off. Especially if they've got a little bit of crossbreeding in them, okay? I wish I had a lot more time, because I want to talk about things that we don't have time to talk about. Um, so how has the way we feed cattle changed? There's one, there's one culprit out there that's changed the whole scenario. It's right there. That's our big problem. This problem right here is probably the closest thing and then this is where you where you really get up, where you really make up your mind whether Cody's a, an, an insane farmer or not. This little guy here could be responsible for eventually, if we don't change, 
if we keep going the way that we're going, could end humanity on earth. It is that big. It is that big of a thing. And why am I saying that? Because as humans and the animals that we're eating are now surviving on this primarily. Yes, you guys. Over 70% of all food sold and packaged in the United States has soybean or corn in it. Most of it has corn. I don't have to describe the health of the country these days of, of humans. And when I, we're already, we've already discovered that it's not profitable at the ranch. Why are we doing this? Not to mention the ecolog ecological damage that we're doing to our drinking water. Our soils that are washing down the Mississippi. See what we're talking about here? This holistic, this holistic way of looking at our farms and ranches. It's much, it's much, much more involved than just partitioning off a, a, a paddock. Much more involved than just creating a, a, a mixed ration of an animal. How much does he need? We're, we're, we're talking about the profitability of it, the sustainability of it, and the ability to exist on planet Earth for a long time. And I'm going to blame a lot of it on that little guy right there. But let's go on. Thoughts on experts. If something has to be done and all of your experts convince you that it cannot be done, then change your experts and do it. That's pretty much what I've had to do. And back in the 90s, oh my gosh, there was, there was nobody following me. There's not very many now, but. On May 15th, a few years ago, um, and this is not typically, I mean, this is not really unusual. Um, this is right down the road from my ranch. May 15th, and this guy's feeding some hay on uh, some not-so-good pasture on some not-so-good cows, okay? See those rocks and all those, those oak sprouts? That's what my country looks like. That's what we're talking about here. Managed, particularly managed the way this neighbor of mine manages. On that same day, I took this photograph. Remember, May 15th. Um, that's an Argentine gate, by the way. It doesn't unlock by itself. That's just a piece of PVC pipe. We picked this up in Argentina, actually, the idea. And you can have a gate wherever you want it. You can even drive a truck or a pickup, I mean, a truck or a tractor or a four-wheeler. Um, some of my horses won't ride under it because they know it's electric. Okay? Um, same day. You want to you wanna, 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 wanna look like that? But like that, it's just a couple miles down the road. So what we do on our farms and ranches and how we manage them can move us off of that losing of $75 a year per cow as being the best scenario. There are other better scenarios. But we can't keep doing what we've always been done. What we've always done. And uh, we talk a lot about tools, um, good tools and bad tools. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk bad about any specific uh, dealer. Um, I don't own any of that equipment. I do own a nice brand new tractor. Um, the main use that my tractor has is it pulls two hay wagons that are tied together to give farm tours around the farm, let everybody see what we're doing. Um, we put this we put this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then we started making money actually. And our production started going up. I made a I I don't have much conversation at the coffee shop with the John Deere dealer, or the, fer or the fertilized salesman, or the seed salesman, or many, many, many other advertisers that are in that beef magazine that I just showed. Remember the three R's. Try never to buy things that rust, rot, and cannot be produced. If you try this really hard, you'll see some improvement. You will not be able to stay with this 100%. But if you can remember the three R's, try to buy things that will not rust, will not rot, and will not reproduce on your farm and ranch, you're going to be making a step forward. Okay? Electric fence will eventually rust. Okay? It does not reproduce, but it has some value, I believe. I mean, it has a lot of value. Change the system. Holistic plant grazing no needs to me. No machinery. You saw me riding around in a four-wheeler when my wife was taking that video several years ago. So there are some exceptions, aren't there? And she mentioned in that video that you could do this on foot. We did this on foot for many years because I had no trust in, in this system. I have complete trust in this system now. 
this is me excited. I know I don't look very excited, but I am really, really excited about this, this whole system. I was also one of the, one of the, in, in the old cowboy line that says, by golly, there will never be a four-wheeler on my ranch. This is horses and cattle. This We're in this for the serious line, remember? Yeah, I lost, like the magazine said, losing $75 a year for every cow I had. That's how serious it was. Okay? The four-wheeler, I think, is an absolute necessity when you really want to get serious with this thing. Unless you really, really like walking. Okay? Graze year-round. I don't care where you're at. We can graze year-round. No, practically no exceptions. Um, we have no fertility bill. We raise all our heifers and bulls. We have a close herd on every animal species we have, which is absolutely a necessity. I'm not very good friends with any seed stock grower in any part of the country. Reduce your workload enormously. High residual grazing method. We're going to graze grass that will eventually be six foot tall, eight foot tall, ten foot tall. I'll tell you a real stiff short story. I hope I don't get off too far. But there was uh, Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley. The year was 1770 something. The guy writes in one of his journals. Uh, he's a uh, what do you call those guys that go around and measure things? Uh, the fields and farms? Surveyor. He's a surveyor. Remember, over 200 years ago, this guy's a surveyor. And in, in one of his notebooks, he writes about being in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Now, for those of you that don't, uh, don't have been to, to, to Virginia before, Virginia's a lot like Missouri. Uh, remember the pictures of my neighbors with the rocks on top of the ground and the cedar trees? A lot of Virginia looks just like that today. But in this document that this, excuse me, this surveyor is, is, is recording, he writes that he's riding his horse through uh, an open pasture in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and sitting in, in, on his horse, he's able to take strands of grass and tie them together across his saddle. So how tall would that grass be, a man sitting on a horse Tying the ends of grass atop his saddle. Seven foot tall, eight foot tall. This thing about, it may not have been called holistic plant grazing. They probably didn't even use the word holistic. But this idea of growing tall grass and residual grass, and this idea about multi species both in plants and multi species both in animals, is nothing new. It, it, it is. It is, as, it is as old as Moses. I really enjoy reading a lot of literature written prior to the 20th century, a lot of it written prior to the 19th century. That's where I have to go to get good information on the things that we're talking about now. Hopefully more, more people get excited about where we are today in the soil conservation and the extension and the university. As we build this excitement, Maybe we will get more literature, more modern literature. But what we're talking about, the guys today, it's not new. It is not. It, it existed for for about six thousand years. We're going to increase our curing capacity. We went from 125 cows to 300 cows, and and that many more animals of utilization of forage. So you might say we went from 125 cows to 600 cows. And by the way, we're understocked. So we're going to increase carrying capacity of all animals and we're going to improve net income, which is what, one of the reasons I was in agriculture to begin with. And it probably is the main reason I still stay. I want to make money from what we're doing. It's not just a way of life. We have to evaluate the way that we manage time. In the old system, at the top of this pyramid, is where we would have, this pyramid is what would have been turned upside down if you visited me 25 years ago. Um, 25 years ago, I would have spent practically no time in education. I would have spent a, a great deal of time in just putting out fires, vet care, and machinery, okay? And stored forages, okay? Today, we want to spend, we want to flip that pyramid like this. We want to spend most of our time reading, learning, going to seminars, improving our education, and an enormous amount of time learning about pasture and soil management. So we don't spend hardly any time fighting fires and very little time machinery. 
Well, I like my new tractor, though. It's an orange Kubota tractor with a cab, heat and air. It's great. <laughs> it's really great. There's another shot of uh, some of our hair sheep. We, we lamb five times every three years. We average 1.8 lambs per lambing. So we're not lambing quite twice a year. We're not quite averaging two times two lambs for every ewe, but that's a long ways away from 0.85 that if we're lucky, that's what our cow for to last. If we're lucky. There's my silly wife. By the way, I can go anywhere I want to on the ranch, but I can't go in the milk bar. I'm not allowed to touch her cows. Go even go in. She, one, one, I'll tell you another real short story. She, she got sick one, one time several years ago, and I can't remember if it was a heifer or just a stubborn Jersey cow, and she milks in a flat stanchion barn. And this girl would not go in the stall, okay? So what's a cowboy do when he tries to move a cow that doesn't want to move? What's he grab? A rope. Of course you grab a rope. She happened to walk into the milk barn while I was, had a, a rope around that, that heifer's neck and was pulling her into the stanchion. That was the last time she ever asked me to milk, even if she's sick or not. Which didn't hurt my feelings. And by the way, I didn't get the heifer in the stanchion that I was. There she was when she uh, years ago when she was still milking by hand. No matter how simplistic, no matter how old timey, uh, no no matter how California tree hugger. I don't want to offend anybody, but no matter how. California tree huggy, it might sound from this cowboy. Do not overlook the simplicity of another species and the, the possible profitability of it. I'm not telling you to go home and buy Jersey cows and, and, and sell milk. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying go home and think about some of these things that, you, that, that I'm saying is working on my ranch. Come up with your own ideas that might improve the possibilities beyond that most unprofitable animal on the farm, which is a cow. Remember, I still like my cows and I still talk bad about them. Okay? But there's a no, a, another whole world out there. You know, I've talked to pig guys for a long, long time. Guys that have raised tens of thousands of pigs. Guys older than I have. They didn't, they didn't have a clue that a pig could eat grass. Our pigs our pig's diet is about, we estimate between 65 and 75% of their diet is on grass. Grass and forbs, and they love red clover like you see there. And I like the flat, the floppy eared red and black ones. Okay? I don't like the, the tippy eared white ones. Hundred percent grass fed, no supplements, no minerals whatsoever. Cow can walk five miles to water just fine. Ian Michelinus says she could only die once. Now, I'm, I'm, I didn't agree with that a few years ago. I agree with that now. We're in this for making money, okay? The, the, the most expensive bulls that are sold every year with some of the most, most outrageous EPDs need to die. They need to die. They would do you a favor if most of them would die before they reach your farm. Because if they don't, you're going to breed your cows to them, and the heifers that come out of them are going to do what he did, which means extremely low production on your grass. Now, if you want to feed them corn and wind up in that category that the beef magazine from KSU reported at losing almost $500 a year per cow, go ahead and do that, okay? This is a little bull that uh, has never had a bite of grain in his life. And he's not gonna weigh 650 pounds at weaning. But you heard someone else already earlier this morning talk about grass feeding. We're not worried, we're not concerned about producing the heaviest weight calf in the county, okay? I don't care what my calves weigh. I, I, I could care less. We don't castrate either. That's a whole other story. There's a dung beetle right in the middle of that manure pile. Dung beetle's about the size of a house fly that's down in the left-hand corner. I love my dung beetles almost as much as I love my sheep. Dung beetles are absolutely a necessity. Anything that kills my dung beetles, I'm an enemy against. And what would that be? That would be all immunizations, all antibiotics, 
all parasite controls, whether it's being poured on, pumped in, sp sprayed and drifted across my neighbors, I don't care what it is. I don't want any of it. All it's going to do is cost me money. I want that dung beetle by the millions, okay? I like a lot of these guys too, a lot of the earthworms. The dung beetle and the earthworm are a couple of those things in the soil that you can actually see. There are literally billions and billions of unidentified yet little creatures called microbiology that you cannot see. We have, in this holistic system, we've got to promote the growth of those things that we cannot see. And I'm hard to convince some of these old timers like myself to do that. How do we promote the growth of things that we cannot see? The microbiology in the soil. First of all, we've got to put things in the top of the soil that's going to kill them. Then they will start multiplying. Moving those animals in that scenario that the video showed is the beginning stages. That doesn't end right there. That's the beginning stages. And what were we doing? What was I doing in that video? Moving those animals. I was not, I'm not just partitioning feed out. Let me tell you another short story if I hope I don't go over my time. I want you to sit back and relax. I want you to picture yourself in the year about 1854, okay? 1854, 1855. There's a family that was on a wagon ride from the East Coast to somewhere in the Northwest Territory for the so-called free land. There were two stagecoats, stage, I'm sorry, there were two uh, covered wagons, three or four horse riders, and they did have at least one milk cow. It's a small group of people going to start a new life in the new land. They finally crossed the Mississippi. It took a year to do this, okay, to get where they were going. Let's fast forward from the Mississippi. Remember, these guys, 1850s, okay? No electricity, okay? Traveling very, very slowly to this new free land to start a new life. Across the Mississippi, they reach the plains. They start hearing this rumbling noise, an unfamiliar rumbling noise. Remember, they're sitting in a wagon, sitting on a horse, haven't seen anybody except Indians for probably six months or more. And how do we know this actually happened? Because the mother, the matriarch of the group, was keeping was keeping the diary. Every evening, she would write this diary what happened during, the, during this long, arduous trip. They started hearing this rumbling out on the prairie. Couldn't see anything. Okay? This was early in the morning. The rumbling gets louder and louder and louder. They're on the downhill side of a little knoll that was stretched out over a huge prairie. Then this, this sound, this rumbling, this hammering gets louder and louder and louder. Finally, the wagon in the front pulls up over this knoll out on the prairie. And there it is. And the mother writes in her diary that night. And as far as they could see in front of them, and as far as they could see to the left and to the right, anybody want to guess what they saw? Bison. It's far, far. It's an ocean wave of bison. Lunchtime came, okay? Remember, they're traveling. They can't see the end of these buffalo, these bison. What are they going to do? Turn around, make a lot of noise, and take a, take a chance of this this humongous herd of animals trampling and killing them all. By the way, she reports that the bison have all the, the bison have all their heads down, they're grazing, moving in the opposite direction that the wagons are moving. So they're coming into a head head collision. Okay, lunch time comes. What are they going to do? They decide to just keep on driving through at a very slow pace and be very, very quietly as they do it. And she writes in her diary that at lunchtime they ate cold biscuits left over from breakfast. They keep on driving, keep on driving, keep on driving. That evening as the sun starts to go down, she writes in her diary again. Now when I look out the back of my now when I look out the front of my wagon, it's the same thing that I see when I look out the back of my wagon. As far as I can see, all around me is an ocean of bison still moving slowly and grazing. This is all day long. They just, she writes in her diary, we could not stop and make camp, so we ate cold bacon and biscuits again for supper. And they kept on moving all night long. The sun comes up the next morning. What happens again? As far as she can see again, just animals everywhere. She writes in her diary, 
keeps riding their diary. They couldn't stop. They couldn't make camp. They keep on riding. The third morning they do that, they finally come out on the other side of that huge bison herd. Guess what she writes in her diary that they saw? Total destruction, she thought. There was nothing standing anywhere. And there were dead animals, some young, some very old, everywhere. What was happening in, in that scenario? Anybody want to guess? They were being rotated, weren't they? <laughs> they were actually being rotated. We know now that they were being rotated in a four-state area, but the predators were the driving force and the natural instincts of that rotation. What was happening in about a year's time, that humongous bison herd had made a complete circle, okay? And they would have rotated themselves in a mid fashion, bunched up tight because of the predator situation, primarily. In about a year's time, they would come back around to where they were this time last year, and the grass would be extremely tall. Remember about the guy that rode in Virginia? Wrote about tying the, tying the ends of the grass together over the top of the saddle. That's what they saw, and that's what they were grazing out in the Northwest. There's an enormous amount of evidence to support that this country was full of grass that you could tie together over the top of a saddle on a horse from the East Coast to the West Coast. There's an enormous amount of evidence to support that during that period of time, there were more bison and other animals grazing and browsing in North America than there are domesticated cows today. What does that mean? And really, what, so I said that, what's it really mean? What it really means is with all our technology, with all our smarts and all our education, we're producing less meat today than nature did on its own 300 years ago. Boy, we're a smart bunch. And we can do it and only lose $75 per cow a year. Wow. It took me almost 40 years to come to that conclusion. I'm not a very fast thinker. Let's keep on going. I've lost track of time. And if I go over and I need to stop, just holler, I'll stop. This is what a close-up stand of grass looks like in the summertime. You know, uh, i got to be careful I don't get off on a tangent. But there's a, um, we, did a lot of, we do a lot of test plots. It's not unusual for us to have 80 to 90 different species and varieties of plants in a given area. I can see about 20 just right there on the name, okay? What are we doing? What were those buffalo doing when they were making that return? What, what have we been talking about about this rotation, this mick grazing? We're laying down carbon. Carbon is what we talk about in a grass form for farmers and ranchers. We're laying that grass down. We're also depositing a lot of very, very valuable manure and urine to the top few inches of soil because we're going to build organic matter which we eventually turn into, this is not a very professional thing to say, but it's going to turn into humans, okay? Why? <laughs> why am I going to do this? So, so I, now I know why I'm doing Why am I going to do this? Because if I can produce more humus, I will produce, remember I'm going to increase my carrying capacity? I'm going, to use, I'm going to produce very, very healthy soil, going to produce very, very healthy plants, so I don't have to use antibiotics and all the other stuff that we talked about, okay? But I'm going to have to do it on the top few inches of soil. And these are my tools that I have. Remember, I'm not going to go to the dealership. I've got grazing, animal impact, rest, and soil biology. And if we had a lot of time to talk about holistic plant grazing, we would spend about three or four hours on each one of these topics. They are extremely important. I'm going to, while I'm thinking about it, if you're interested in this, and I really hope you are, I'm going to give you a couple of names of a couple of books. Definitely Alan Savory's Holistic Management book. Spend some time. It's the hardest thing I've ever read in my life. I bought it. I, I opened up the pages. It took me about three or four days to get three pages. I put it down. I didn't pick it up for at least another year. Now I read it once every year. Please stay with it. Another book, Android, Android Voice. In fact, buy anything. Read anything Android Voice and talks about. Okay. There's a lot of other books, but at least those few. These are the tools that we have. If you're going to, if we're going to try to make improvements without losing four or five hundred dollars a year per cow, these are the tools that we're going to use. If they don't lie within these tools, it's probably going to cost us money. We're going to build soil organic matter using livestock. That's what it is. That is what the grazing part primarily is all about. It's not about partitioning a little bit of feed to an animal in a short amount of time. 
It's about building soil organic matter so we can be more productive, so we can run more animals per acre, so we can have more healthy animals without expensive labor and technology to keep them healthy. In the early stages, this is what, what I was doing. Uh, now, for some of you that, that, that can't figure this out, the grass in the forefront, what little grass you see, is what the cows haven't eaten yet. There's hardly anything there, okay? And in the early stages, when I was trying to maybe prove to myself that some of the things that Andre Voison and guys like Alan Savory and, and Ian Mitchellinus were talking about, I, I had to prove to myself if I'm going to if I'm going to use it, okay, I had to prove to my own self that there's actually value in it. So what I'm saying here, no matter what condition your stand of grass is or your soil or your rock pile, I don't care what it is, you've got to unroll wire, you've got to move animals, whether it looks like there's nothing there or not. The last thing we want to do is put all the hay in one place when if we have to feed hay and let all the manure and urine get wasted in one place. Move them every, at least every single day, or it's going to be a very, very, very slow process to build that soil organic matter, which is what it's all about when we're talking about moving animals. The foreground is where the cows have already eaten. You can see the manure piles back there. So we've done some good back there. How do I know we've done some good back there? There's a photograph of a couple of years later of the same thing. It will make a difference. No seed, no fertility purchase whatsoever. All we're doing is moving animals. Remember, we're going to spend a great deal of our time at the bottom of that pyramid on education. We've got to learn some things that we weren't taught, okay? And we're probably going to have to teach them ourselves because there's not a lot of professional educational institutions out there that are supporting this.